Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah? Perfect. Great. So today, I'm very happy to present the inside truth behind real monetization, a uh, 45 crash course in payments with some kick-ass experts working day-to-day -day with payments. And I think in an ever more competitive gaming environment, growing bid prices on Google and Facebook, it's becoming more and more important to really optimize payments. And I think we're gonna dive deep into this topic today. If you have any questions, just stand up, grab one of the microphones. There's also someone running around. Feel free to make this interactive and have fun, okay? Um, Hein, can you please start and introduce yourself Yes, sure. My name is Hein Krenz. I'm currently working as Senior Payment Manager at InnoGames. Yeah, I'm uh, in uh, the industry for four and a half years. Um, I worked previously for Bigpoint, Gamigo, and Good Games. Yeah. So I hope you will enjoy this round. My name is Victor. Um, I work as a director of business development and payments at the company Just a Game in Berlin. Um, I had some, uh, qu also quite years of experience in the games industry and the payments industry. And I welcome you guys. Thank you for being for being here. Yeah, my name is uh, Mark Turban. I'm uh, head of payments and business development at Gamigo. Uh, I've been at Gamigo for about a year doing the payment systems and uh, I was previously in uh, business development uh, for a smaller payment provider. So also American and uh, living in Germany. Hi. Hello, my name is Waldemar Erli. I speak leider nur Deutsch, aber ich wollte so gerne dabei sein, dass man mir das erlaubt hat und ein extra Übersetzer zugewiesen hat. <laughs> also ich uh, leite die Billingabteilung bei Mail.ru Games GmbH. Das ist eine Tocht ein Tochterunternehmer von äh, russischem Marktführer Mail.ru. Äh, wir publishen in den äh, europäischen Ländern also die Spiele von unserem hauptsächlich von unserem Mutterkonzern, aber auch äh, lizenzierte Projekte aus anderen Ländern. Who doesn't speak so. German? Okay. So just uh, shortly translate, Valdemar von Mail.ru Games, uh, he's the head of billing and they publish great games and license also. Uh, my name is uh, Udo Reep uh, and I'm uh, the head of business development uh, at Game Art Studio. I'm working for about four and a half years in the industry with uh, two years of experience in payment and another two years in uh, translations, customer care, and so on. Great, thank you very much, guys. So, you know, you're all payment managers. What does it mean, you know? What does it mean for day-to-day -day role? What exactly do you do, Mark? I mean, how does it look like? Well, if I were pretty much to start, I think I, I know some of you guys out there, and uh, I think I might be seen as kind of a guy who's looking to, to save a little bit of money for the company. Um, Basically, when it comes down to it, as a payment manager, um, you know, we're the persons or we're the people who are responsible for an actual operating cost of a company. So when it comes down to it, um, every little bit that we end up saving is actual pure profit in the end for the company. So for me, payments in, in this role is an ex a very crucial part of the business um, that, I, that I see a lot of people uh, do tend to be missing from their, from their businesses. So, um, yeah, that's generally how I put it in short. Do you agree with that? Or? Um, I think uh, what Mark left out is that we are the bad guys from uh, the online games uh, companies. We are the guys who uh, uh, the payment companies come to sell to us, and we have to be the bad guys who have to say, no, this is not what we want, this is not what we want. Uh, we, want we, uh, we negotiate with... Uh, with payment companies, but uh, I hope that you understand that this is our job. This is what uh, what we are paid. We are being paid to do. We we are being paid to get the last cent from from uh, from each transaction from uh, from each uh, user, and uh, I uh, we are here to share s uh, some of this knowledge with you guys. 
So what about like game design? What about systems, KPIs? Are you working with that as well? And how exactly? Well, uh, I'd like to say, uh, as a payment manager, you're in fact, uh, you have an inter kind of interface role because you're working with management, uh, with support, uh, with game design, and of course with systems administration. So um, on one point, of course, you have uh, the whole trouble with uh, arranging the agreements, the negotiations, and so on. <laughs> but uh, you also have to make sure uh, to uh, uh, arrange a, for a decent uh, payment flow and for a good user experience. And this uh, means on one side uh, also listening to your users, listening to support, working closely with support, also assisting support in case of payment problems, and of course, uh, speaking to the developers, not only on technical points of payment integration, but also on uh, how to do it best. Because uh, uh, normally it is the users who tell you which payment method they want. And it's your job uh, to get it right and to get it right in such a way that your company can make good profit from it. So, Hein, you've seen different companies, right? So, uh, I guess, what are, what are your best practices? You know, what, what have you learned over the last 12 years? Yeah, what I do is normally, uh, first of all, I look to the payment window, so the whole payment flow, and try to optimize it to cut down unnecessary steps in the user flow. For sure, renegotiating contracts with, with the current suppliers or looking out for new ones. And um, yeah, this is our two, two uh, of my main, main challenges every day. How many steps? Sorry? How many steps? Uh, you mean what the perfect uh, payment flow would, should take a user? Yeah, I would guess or say it's not more than three steps beside the ones which are uh, driven by the payment providers themselves. You all agree or? No, <laughs> um, there are certain payment solutions out there that, uh, for example, have like a, a one-click process, um, or they're even now down to like two steps. Uh, for example, like PayPal. Um, yeah, but Mark, yeah. may I interrupt you? Uh, yeah. Is it implemented at Gamigo? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> of course, but um, yeah, I will. I will go on on that actually. That. Uh, there are uh, definitely some uh, payments out there that could be um, dropped down to a few more steps. And that's actually, I mean, some of you guys here are from some of those companies, and it might be something that you guys could work on. It's kind of one of those things where fewer steps for us is actually better. So, yeah. What, what are other best practices? I mean, what can you share? I mean, you work on a day to day. You know, what are your learnings? Uh, well, um one point I would like to add, uh, I think there's some kind of general rule that every uh, click, every additional click uh, you have to make in the payment process costs you about 10% of conversion. I don't know if it's true, but it's one point, of course, uh, to reduce um, uh, the number of steps. Um, best practice has basically two sides. One is uh, from the user point, you have to implement a payment process which is optimal for the user and on the other side, of course, it's the company who makes the money. So you also have to uh, arrange kind of a business flow in such a way that it's easy for the merchant, that uh, you have all the documents, that uh, the technology works properly, that you have a sound invoicing process, all is done in due time and you shouldn't spend, uh, it's, it's the internet, it's supposed to work without uh, people putting human effort into it. Once it's set up, it should work like a Swiss clock. So you work on weekends or? No, I actually just watch it. <laughs> right. um, so I mean, if you look at games in general, they, they have become pretty global phenomena. Uh, you see companies having traffic all over the world. Um, what does it mean for you guys? Um, Victor, I mean, how do you how do you handle that, for example? Well, you always have to look for the local payment solutions that each uh, country offers to you, and um, 
the fact that you have a payment solution available in, in one country doesn't mean there is the best solution for you. Some payment solutions are very expensive, so you, you, you always have to find um, the, the solution that, uh, that best applies for you. Many of you know that in uh, Poland, uh, the most popular payment solution is uh, mobile payments. Um, uh, to be honest, I hate this fact because it's so expensive that at the end of the day, what you get out of out of the out of the uh, transaction is it's 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 almost nothing. I I remember uh, one month when I was doing the I was checking numbers. I had the same amount of transactions in Germany as in Poland, and the amount of money was less than the half from 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 the payouts from uh, from uh, from Poland. So you have to be really looking to into uh, which payment solutions you're going to be in each country and also try to see, to, to uh, uh, have realistic uh, expectations. You're not going to make the same amount of money you do in Germany as in Poland, as in, uh, I don't know, Latin America or as uh, Russia or as Australia or uh, North Africa. So I heard like Turkey, Poland, Brazil is booming right now for a lot of companies. How do you do it? I mean, Poland is one example. How do you, how do you monetize Turkey? <laughs> All right. <laughs> don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> We're just trying to. There for Turkey, you have uh, a few options, but um, um, Turkey is a very special market. Uh, there's quite a prevalence of uh, internet cafes and so-called uh, e-pin solutions. If you want uh, to do some good business in Turkey, you have to have the internet cafes. So you have to. Uh, you just need a big partner who has access to the internet cafes and distributes. Uh, either your e-PIN solutions or their e-PIN solutions. Uh, there's another option is uh, mobile payment, but uh, there uh, it's quite uh, expensive and uh, the terms are not uh, so interesting and my experience was rather that it's not so attractive. So Turkey is in my eyes a difficult market. So Brazil? Um, even worse, yeah. <laughs> okay. So a lot of potential, right? Valdemar, <laughs> um, uh, you, you're Russian. Um, how do you pay there? Wie wie zahlt ihr in Russland? Das ist eine eigentlich gute Frage. Ich verantworte bei uns das Payment-Geschäft in Europa, <lacht> nicht, nicht in Russland. <lacht> ich kann klar, das so einige sagen. Also in Russland sind äh, ja solche äh, traditionelle Zahlungsmethoden wie PayPal, Kreditkarte nicht unbedingt im Einsatz, zumindest groß im Einsatz. Äh, da gibt es natürlich wie auf jedem halt anderen Markt eigene Zahlungsmethode, Methoden, äh, die da mehr beliebt sind. Und äh, da sind speziell für Russland ist das zum Beispiel Western Union, was hier in Deutschland praktisch nicht gibt. Okay. Also da hat, soweit ich weiß, also fast jeder Russe, also so I mean, an account. Great, so just shortly translate, yeah, it's completely different payment infrastructure in Russia. If you want to do it, talk to him, although he has the fun part of basically not dealing with it because he's focused on the European uh, side of the business. Yeah. I think uh, that's very, uh, something very good. <laughs> um, so I mean, y you say like you have uh, local payment options everywhere, right? And it sounds like super complicated. I mean, I know from like talking to a lot of you guys, uh, often or how often you let me, uh, um, um, that there are always tax cycles involved. So how do you deal with it? Do you integrate the, these payment options all direct? Do you use uh, payment aggregators, PSPs? What exactly do you use and, and for which payment channels? Yeah, that's really depending on the payment methods. Um, so for um, mobile payments, I never would use direct connections because uh, it could mean a lot of hassle and furthermore a lot of work to uh, integrate all the um, the operators country by country. For other options it uh, make way more sense to use a PSP or yeah let's say if you're just a startup uh, company and you don't have the capacities to do a lot of integrations it's a good way to use a PSP to get uh, hold of, of a lot of payment methods. So do you use a PSP or? Yeah, we do, yeah. for sure. For, for mobile payments or credit card, PayPal? Both. Okay. Yeah. 
I am more the opinion on uh, depending on on the size of your company and and and, and on your uh, resources. If you have a, a a company where you have a limited technical resources, I guess the best option for you is for uh, for the moment to go with uh, with an aggregator. The best uh, recommendation I think is um, from our side is talk to the guys, uh, talk to other companies, talk to other uh, companies that uh, are in the same position as you, so uh, so you get to know what what the, the real cost of uh, a payment transaction is. So so you get to know what uh, uh, what you're paying. Sometimes it's a bit um, I don't know strange to hear that some companies don't talk to each other and that they are paying much more for the services that that uh, we do. Um, I'm pretty much a pretty big fan of direct integrations. Um, I think that PSPs are really, really handy at the beginning for like when you're trying to get a few things taken care of, like compliance issues with PCI compliance. Um, if you're looking to well, what does it mean? Uh, that's basically a set of standards that you have a security set um, set by the credit card companies, um, where they have different levels of security that you have to hold, and it's very expensive actually. Um, for, for your company to maintain those levels. Um, and there's something like 200 and some odd requirements that you have to have in your technical infrastructure. Um, so for credit cards, I would generally say if I didn't have the money, I'd probably be going through a PSP um, just because it's much easier, it's more cost effective, and it's probably worth uh, a little bit extra margin for them. Um, regarding the other types of payments, for example, um, I like to use like PayPal quite often because I'm an American, you know, and we're kind of addicted to these things. Um, this is something where I'd rather, unless uh, I'm more interested in having uh, my own fraud tools built up, um, I won't use a PSP unless, uh, and I'd rather use a direct integration if I want higher conversions because it's a shorter process, generally. Although there are some companies which offer um, processes that look like their direct integrations, so. so. So is the fraud management done by the PSP or by you directly? Or? Well, the fraud management, it's, that's the thing. If we have that in-house, then that's something that we develop and we put money into. And sure, that's, that's uh, something where we're saving money on. But uh, there are other companies which will charge you like per transaction uh, a, a fixed fee, even if the transaction doesn't go through. So if I have someone who has funds like you know, trying to test my system all day, they're costing me money for failed transactions for the fraud checks. So if I had that, uh, I guess you could say internally rather than externally, as in like internally developed, then it costs me nothing. But if I work with a PSP, that, c that can cost me a pretty penny for some, not all, but some. So I've been a fan of PSP as from direct. Uh, direct payment, uh, aber das durch interne Abläufe in der Firma bedingt, dass ich immer Mangel an Entwicklern habe. Und für mich ist es sehr, sehr wichtig, dass ich halt vor allem bei neuen Projekten innerhalb kürzester Zeit so, viel, so viel mit neue Zahlungsmethode da einschließe wie möglich. Das ist der Vorteil, also der, auch der andere Vorteil bei PSP, dass ich sehe, dass da man dadurch die Konsolidierung der Umsätze ziemlich gutes Gewicht äh, bei dem Partner hat, so dass man ihn irgendwie dazu zwingen kann, manche Prozesse anders zu, gest also zu gestalten, also was womöglich äh, mehr anzubieten, was anfangs da halt drin war und dadurch man eigentlich die interne äh, Arbeit, also die in der Firma halt mit Zahlungsverkehr entsteht, dann auf den Partner überträgt, zumindest teilweise. Okay, let me, let me try to <laughs> yeah, translate okay. that shortly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, I think uh, Valmar said, big fan of um, PSP, working with PSP, uh, not because he's always wants that, but basically because also because of resource uh, uh, um, topics. Um, but then you can learn and optimize based on that. Uh, you learn what works well, and then you can go for direct integration um, later on uh, for the PSPs here. Yeah comment on that. Um, Udo, do you use a PSP? Do you, I mean, yeah, I uh, would rather agree with Mark. I think it's um, on one point it's true. If you're a small company or you just enter a market, it's always a better try to use a PSP to take all at once and then check out which payment methods work uh, best and then eliminate the middleman. 
But uh, as a general rule, um, there are two main aspects. One is market size and the one is the payment behavior. So in the big markets, uh, it's always interesting to uh, make a direct integration for the high volume methods. And if you have a market like the Russian Federation with, uh, well, good dozen or 24 uh, payments or who knows what uh, with cash machines in Ukraine, Belarus and so on and so on, um, you will go crazy if you will try to uh, implement all these. So in such, uh, for such countries, it's always uh, um, the better choice uh, to use payment service provider. So, so just one question, I mean, how many payments have your companies integrated? I have, thi I think about 15 or 20. 15, 20? Yeah. Waldemar, wie viele wie viel Payment Methoden integriert? Wie viele hat's? Gute Frage, also so unerwartet. <lacht> ja, ich würde sagen so an die 30. 30? 30? Mark? Is that, uh, I missed that, but is that direct, or direct integration or PSP integration? Let's say for, from a user perspective, like how many? Oh, like uh, we have 47 plus total. Okay. Yeah. I guess we are between 20 and 30 probably. Okay. Yeah, I think we have between, or I would say above 50, yeah. 50? Yeah, above 50. So, when I talked to you guys before the panel, you know, you were referring to like there's some hidden costs within payments. I mean, like, um, Mark, maybe like shortly explain what exactly you mean by like hidden costs, and 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 you know, if you if you really look into this, you know, how do you avoid hidden costs? Because obviously that's something you don't really like, increasing uh, profitability. Uh, hidden costs, in my, in my view, are basically things that you're not being presented when you're being told the price of everything. So. For example, um, uh, my favorite thing, maybe that's that's probably easy for a lot of people if you're Germans in the room, or, uh, is direct debit. Um, it's a really, really cheap payment method, like it costs almost nothing. But then when you, if you work with a bank, it costs you uh, somewhere around 10 times the amount of the transaction um, for if you're talking about a direct bank integration um, at, for the chargeback cost. Um, and that's basically if a user says, uh, I never paid for this or there was fraud, um, that's one issue. And if you're a PSP, ha ha ha, I, I've seen some really interesting cases there where uh, people will charge uh, quite a bit higher than the uh, transaction cost. Uh, and it's almost, I don't want to say highway robbery like we'd say in the States, but it's, it's really expensive. So um, if you have a charge back, if, if you don't have good chargeback protection uh, for, for direct debit as an example, uh, and you have, let's say, 20% chargebacks for your overall volume, they might charge you so much, you won't, you'll lose your entire volume just paying off the, the penalty for it. So there's a lot of uh, things in there that, that you could say are hidden, and there's quite a few more. Some of the other guys will explain, so. Um, I think it all comes down to how much risk you want to take and um, how much um, you want to give to the, uh, to the payment provider. Some payment provider will uh, pr uh, promise you that you have lowest rate, um, uh, sorry, uh, the lowest fees, uh, uh, no chargebacks, but then you, ho you have to open uh, a bank account in, 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 uh, in the country. So you have to measure what's, what's, uh, how much power you want to give away, how much risk you want to take and uh, how much um, yeah, how much fees uh, uh, you really want to pay. Any other hidden costs uh, everybody should know of? Also, I would as uh, versteckte Kosten auch unter anderem, also nicht was im Vertrag steht, bezeichnen, sondern der Aufwand, uh, der man halt uh, nach, dem nach der Integration hat. Right, so durch so durch ein, ein schlecht uh, organisiertes Payment Prozess, also sprich äh, die ständigen Kundenanfragen oder Probleme, die danach kommen, wenn man die im Vorfeld nicht erkennt, bedeuten es extra dann Arbeitsaufwand, der man dann nicht wegschieben kann. Right, so Und das sind Personalkosten. Uh, so like hidden costs as technical integration costs. So if you look at, um, I mean, you, you already mentioned it, fraud. Um, how much fraud do you see uh, in, for example, Germany? I mean, what is the fraud level, the percentage of total volume going through? Hein. 
Yeah, that's pretty much depending on the payment method and of your fraud prevention you do yourself. So it's not that you can, it's, uh, can say it in general. Um, for example, on direct debit, the fraud level is, yeah, I think the highest in Germany. So how much percent uh, approximately? Uh, I would say roughly it's, it's 20, about 20%. 20 percent. 20 percent? Yeah. And on, on, on credit cards, some others, I mean, like, what do you do? Yeah, credit cards, you're, you're, you, you're not allowed to have that uh, kind of fraud rates. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you will get fined. Um, so uh, there you need to be below 1% of your uh, monthly turnover um, with, with MasterCard. And uh, with Visa, you need to be below 2%. Um, so yeah, it's a totally different story. What, what do you see on, do you see fraud on PaySafe card and, and cards in general? On PaySafe card, that would be a miracle how that could happen, but um, yeah, it's, it's not possible as the cards are prepaid. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> there are no chargebacks on prepaid cards. Uh, well, uh, for, in, for upon the point of fraud, you have to take a look on um, how much um, money you want to, to, uh, to, uh, to get, for example, yeah, PaySafe card. I agree, I, I really like PESOF card, but it's a very expensive payment method. So yeah, you you can just forget about uh, about fraud with PESOF card, you, you, just have, you just don't have to worry about fraud, but then you have to pay uh, a lot of money on the on the, uh, on the the fees to PESOF card, and that's with all the pay, uh, prepaid uh, solutions. So again, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's um, about how much control and how much fees you want to pay for each payment method, I guess. I, this is in relation to the fraud. Are there any questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, since you're talking about the inside truth and uh, we were talking about hidden costs, what about the obvious costs? So what is an average overall payment? Some of you favor direct uh, uh, integration, others favor PSP. So what would be your average for um, payment costs in general? Uh, personally, everything that is under 3% is kind of okay. <laughs> but then you go to uh, some prepaid solutions in the US that is 25% and you have to swallow it because it is the only payment solution. And I'm still thinking about it, whether I'm going to implement that or not. But 25% out of the whole revenue, that's a lot of money. And 3%, I think that's, that's, that's fine. So for overall payment costs, you have 3%? Uh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's for uh, okay. when you talk about credit cards, debit cards, or uh, also uh, direct debit. But then you start talking about uh, piece of card, like I said, is way, way more expensive. I don't, be, I don't give shares, uh, sorry, fees, because I'm sure that Hein has different fees than me and Mark has different fees than me as well. But it's, it's, it's kind of... Uh, yeah, expensive and uh, mobile. Mobile, it really, it really depends on the, uh, on the, on the country. But um, things are getting better in mobile. But um, yeah, um, everything that is below three percent, I just say fine. Let's let's sign. But then uh, yeah. Can anyone share like the total payment costs? Or? between uh, 13 and uh, 8%. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> Sorry. Stop, stop. Uh, I have to uh, um, yeah, step in here because I think this is a number you can reach when you're a small company. Um, I would say if you're starting at 20%, so if you, if you calculate it with 20% cost, you should be fine. Sure, it depends in which countries you're going to start because uh, there are different levels of fees or the mixture of the payment methods itself. So there's another question. Yes, um, I wonder uh, what could be done in terms of increasing uh, the payouts from the uh, uh, SMS service, like someone mentioned platform to mobile could be an interesting technology. They are already increased, uh, there's no more space. Yeah. 
it's like uh, in Korea, it's like 93% payout. So I guess there's still space for optimization. It depends actually on the operators because the big thing in the end is that the um, carriers are, are, let's put it this way, the providers are, are basically uh, not in charge of what happens in the end. I mean, they can, they can pitch you something, they can give you their best rate. Um, sometimes they might be able to do a little underwriting and risk management to, to cost shift as an example uh, if you're doing multiple countries, but you probably wouldn't be able to get that in Germany, that's for sure. But what does a carrier charge it in, in Germany, for example? Not, 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 like, not the actual service provider, but like carrier. The provider, of the carriers, are you guys going to be comfortable if I tell you this? Because it's... Well, I think <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a, you can probably get something from a carrier for under 15%. Um, so we're, we're, I would say um, <laughs> you can definitely be a little bit more competitive, uh, but that's also that their margin would be cut down. Like if you're a, a provider, then you're not really making too much. So you can, you can cut down to like bare minimum, um, but that could really hurt them. So, yeah. There's another question. Yes, hi. Uh, you guys are in the game industry, obviously, but uh, you are working on one-time purchases services. Are you looking for subscription? And if yes, uh, what type of services in regarding the games you guys are uh, launching? Well, I don't know if everybody s agrees, but subscription is dead. Um, for the, I think everybody's moving away from subscription. We saw uh, World of Warcraft and most of the EA games, they're, they're, they're going away. I think the question is here now, what is after free to play? What is what is going to come after? I think that's 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 what I see from from the industry. It's not my opinion, and at the same time, um, we see that the um, subscription model is a bit uh, criminalized because it was so abused recently. That uh, I think, especially in Germany, is still the case where uh, users and they and they. Uh, without uh, knowing it, they just subscribe to a ringtone service or, yes. or something like that. I agree with that with mobile content years ago, but now that we come for services that uh, users are demanding for, do you think that subscription may have a new room for in the gaming industry especially? Um, to be honest, I think all of us are making our money from, from, from free to play and, and I, don't, I, I honestly don't see a subscription model coming, coming again and maybe free-to-play gives more money than, than subscription. Uh, I have a different opinion about this. I think there are models you can run uh, through sub subscription services. Um, I wouldn't sell the whole game through a uh, subscription model, but um, you can sell features to the user which you for sure could charge him in a, yeah, as a subscription model. Uh, I would also agree with Hein. I think uh, we will see some uh, new developments with uh, subscription models, and there are, of course, uh, certain types of uh, games, <coughs> round-based, for example, which favor a subscription. And if you uh, have a game and uh, can implement subscription models, um, then it will be much better uh, for your revenue, because it is constant. So, uh, last question. Wait, you need a, yeah. Um, you, s you said the main difference uh, for payment was country. Do you see a difference in terms of demographic, like um, the young people all use SMS payments or mobile payments and older people all use credit cards? Is that purely by country? For sure, it's, it's driven by the demographics as well. As uh, younger people um, have more or easy access to a mobile, um, instead of a credit card or bank account. So for sure you're right, it's driven as well by the demographics. I'd like to give an example to that as well, because I actually agree. Um, for, the, for example, in the United States, um, most people there uh, pay with credit cards or PayPal, it's like 90% of the market. Um, but the big thing that everyone keeps forgetting is that we're dealing with kids' games and stuff sometimes. So. Um, how are kids going to get a credit card in the U.S. when they're not 18? Because in the U.S. it's actually like a, a thing that you have to, be, a requirement for, um, you have to be a certain age to have certain payment methods. So one of the things that actually could be on the increase, um, which might be interesting for this uh, example, is uh, mobile payments. Um, because 
that's how ki most kids probably have a phone from their parents to uh, make sure that everything is okay and everyone's safe at home, but they also use that to pay for little things. So uh, that's how we're going to be getting the little kids a little bit later. That's unfortunately, um, w when I did hear, I believe uh, Frederick uh, mentioned this earlier about the subscription model. I think that that could be a really dangerous thing uh, if, if you have that, for example, in the U.S., um, where you're targeting kids, and then that would be very, very bad for the industry. So, yeah. So, w I have one qu last question. So, how does the future of payments look like? I mean, what are the trends you're observing, um, which you know will define the next ten years in payments? How we should know. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would answer? Well, truly speaking, um, I think uh, the, the, the way we see it is more and more companies are investing in the, in the free-to-play uh, business model. So I think this is, con this is still going to, to, uh, to stay for a while. Uh, but uh, maybe other, other industries, uh, I don't know, gambling or any, uh, any other kinds of entertainment are, are going to bring the, uh, the next business model. Maybe also in mobile. I think mobile, mo mobile devices more than mobile phones are... Uh, um, leading the way on, 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 on how to pay, maybe an NFC or this kind of payment solutions will, will uh, show us the way. But um, at the end of the day, it's, it's the consumer who is going to decide what's, uh, what's best for everybody. Um, this is a good question, and I, I think that it kind of depends how monetization is going to work in the future. Um, my personal belief or the way I see things is that the Internet's becoming every day a little more free. So um, as an example, I think that, uh, you know, w I had a comparison the other day that we made with um, the, the fact that the genres of games are very much like television. And the fact that if you look at mass media, as an example, like television commercials, they're paying for everything for everyone to watch, and it's free content. So basically, I think that in the future, um, a lot of the industry may actually move to the, to the, the fact that they're going to be moving more on, on video ads and, and things like this to actually monetize um, their, their businesses rather than just direct payment methods. I think that payments themselves, I, I don't want to say some will die off, but it's, it could probably shrink the industry a little bit. Um, it is a little bit of an out there theory, I guess you could say, but I think that uh, you know, when, you, when you see what's, what, how people have been able to get huge uh, media companies with uh, television stations and monetize that, they're going to do the same thing uh, with games in the future. So, yeah. The payment industry is very bald, so it must be dirt, because I see the same thing in the last time. In the last time, I must be working with uh, marketing, under anderem, also in, in, in the hinsicht of also auf payment process. Also da verlange ich auch inzwischen also von Partnern, dass sie mich irgendwelche Zusatzinstrumente zur Verfügung stellen, dass sie nicht nur reine Payment-Prozedur durchführen, sondern auch irgendwie dem, mir und dem Kunden also Zusatzservice bieten. Right. So uh, basically, Baldemar thinks that there will be a shift in the payments industry and that payment service providers will you know, add additional tools like tech tools to also market to users probably the payment option. Uh also, as a example, the user, for example, the per SMS zahlen. Also, da meine Vision. Wünsche ich, dass ich bald eine Funktion habe. Also, Partner. Also, <laughs> eine Funktion habe, wo ich die User, die seit einer bestimmten Zeit nicht mehr zum Beispiel aktiv sind, über SMS uh, daran erinnere, dass das Spiel immer noch da ist. Und umgekehrt also so ein Targeting <laughs> over SMS, yeah, for the entrepreneurs here, you know, to found some companies, uh, basically uh, have the transaction over SMS and then retarget the user and basically try to increase retention rates with this kind of service. No? Oder umgekehrt dem User die Möglichkeit gebe, also sich zum Beispiel an einem uh, Nachrichtendienst zu beteiligen oder sich anzumelden, wo der User per SMS wiederum uh, an die Game-Ereignisse aktuelle halt uh, yeah. erinnert wird oder halt überhaupt benachrichtigt wird. Or like uh, messaging to users, what is the news in the games, 
discount uh, options for virtual goods or something like this. Huh? Okay, and but Udo, what is Valdemar, it? Valdemar, I think there are companies out there who offer this already. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so ich werde das kurz übersetzen. Hm. Also, es sind äh, schon Firmen, die das für dich tun können. Ja, das weiß ich. Ich rede jetzt speziell über meine Partner. Ah, okay. Ich meine, der Markt <lacht> muss sich bewegen. Uh, Udo, what, what do you think? Uh, what, is, what is the future of payments for you? Well, yeah, I wish I knew, uh, then I would found a company, but um, I think we will see some uh, deeper integration and uh, some, um, uh, it will become much easier for people to pay. And that's basically the trend going uh, through all platforms. I don't think that uh, we will see something much new, but rather easier and more professional things. Great. Guys, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.